This hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our panel of distinguished witnesses. Uh, I appreciate you being here, and I look forward to our discussion today. And before I uh, begin with uh, my, my opening statement, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, the panel and say thank you for your testimony. But uh, to express, just to be clear, that we didn't receive the, the testimony from NASA and, and from Mr. Stalmer until late yesterday evening, which in the future, I, I understand we all have a lot going on, but it really makes it easier for us to, or helpful for us to prepare for this if we're able to review the testimony further in advance. So I'll just make a request to, to all of you that hopefully we can expedite that more in, in the future so we're not cramming the night before. And as a, a lifelong procrastinator, I understand, uh, but uh, if you all could help us out with that, it would be very, very much appreciated because we've got some very important issues to tackle here today. So uh, to, to begin, uh, beginning our hearing on a review of NASA's plans for the International Space Station and the future of activities in low Earth orbit. For nearly 20 years, the International Space Station has expanded our understanding of what it means to live and work in space. Our investment in the ISS have enabled scientific research, development, and technology. Technology demonstrations from DNA sequencing to advanced technology for water purification worldwide, and much more. More importantly, we haven't done this alone. The ISS is a shining example of international cooperation, as well as innovative relationships for transportation services and expanded partner use of the ISS National Laboratory. I want to acknowledge the NASA, uh, the NASA international and commercial partners who continue to ensure the safe and productive operation of the ISS. As the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel noted, the ISS program deals with the challenges of operating in the space environment su in such a way to make it seem normal business. That's quite an accomplishment. However, there is nothing normal about operating in human spaceflight. I know you all are aware of that. And aging spacesuits and delays in the availability of US commercial crew transportation services are just a few of the risks that need to be addressed looking forward at ISS. In addition to dealing with these and other near-term challenges involved in sustaining the ISS, we also need to look at what lies ahead. While NASA has in affirmed the integrity of the ISS structure through at least 2028, the lifetime of the laboratory is finite. What will come next? How will NASA and the, interna and, and the nation ensure that the objectives for ISS are sustained following the end of ISS operations whenever that occurs? And what are the steps that are needed to occur such that we can have confidence in avoiding the gap between ISS and a future low Earth orbit facility? NASA's International Space Station Transition Report identifies options including transitioning the ISS platform to private industry, augmenting it with privately developed modules, combining portions of the ISS with a new private platform, or deploying a new free-flying platform and deorbiting the ISS. I'm looking forward to learning about more about these and other approaches, because when and how we transition NASA's activities in low Earth orbit from the ISS to an alternative platform op or operating module is critical. NASA has made it clear uh, its plans to transition from a government-owned and operated ISS to a regime where NASA is one of many customers purchasing services from a LEO non-governmental human spaceflight enterprise. This leaves a number of important and urgent questions that must be addressed. Who are these other customers? What does NASA's vision mean? In terms of NASA's commercial LEO development plan, what is the value proposition for the U.S. taxpayer? What level of investment is the private sector willing to make? Are NASA's planned investments in stimulating commercial market demand and supply in LEO going to ensure a smooth transition and prevent a gap in NASA's ISS and low Earth orbit activities? The challenge here is in the balance of risk and reward. Under this plan, the commercial entities aren't the ones assuming the bulk of the risk that, fa that falls 
to NASA, and yet the potential benefits and government to the government and taxpayer are uncertain at best. The question then is what, what the U.S. taxpayer will be on the hook to fund. With no near-term market other than NASA, there is a real question about the cost to the taxpayer. NASA currently pays more than $3 billion a year to operate the International Space Station, a worthwhile investment. But on top of that, NASA's plans to fund the development of one or more commercial space stations, subsidize commercial activity on the ISS, and purchase services from future commercial space stations uh, call into question whether this plan will save NASA money that it can apply to the moon program or if it will end up costing us more, not less, over the next decade. I look forward to getting more into the details. NASA's plan may result in, in impacts to ISS research and technology development that is needed to enable human space expo human exploration of the moon, Mars, and more, which is why these issues are so critical. We also need to understand the potential implications of the plan for ISS, an international partnership on which NASA intends to build its future human space exploration. In closing, the low Earth orbit and microgravity environment may in time support a commercially, commercially viable market. NASA has already taken initiatives to support commercial space through its development of commercial cargo services, commercial crew capabilities, and enabling research and development in low Earth orbit. While NASA's interest in finding innovative approaches and stimulating commercial market in low Earth orbit are well intended, we need to be responsible with the taxpayer's investment in the ISS as a national and international asset, and we need to carefully consider how we ensure a successful transition of our ISS activities going forward. And now I will turn to Ranking Member, Mr. Babin, and for your opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. I want to say thank you to your, our distinguished uh, witnesses here today. And also, I'd like to uh, ex extend a welcome to uh, several folks that are up here from my uh, district, from Johnson Space Center, if you would uh, stand. If you're out there from Johnson Space Center getting your, oh man, we got half the room, okay. <laughs> I knew there were some familiar faces out there, but I wanted to say welcome. I hope you're learning a lot up here about legislation. And uh, with some of the activities that we're going to talk about today are these folks, uh, uh, right in their bailiwick and some of some of their responsibilities. So thank you for being up here. Uh, but anyway, thank you, Chairman uh, Horn, uh, for holding this hearing. The International Space Station is one of humanity's highest technological achievements. As an internationally built and operated uh, orbiting laboratory, the ISS conducts critical research that helps us both on Earth and in space. Uh, as a multinational project, this engineering marvel illustrates the power of U.S. leadership on the frontiers of this exploration. Uh, NASA has worked very hard to conquer the challenges of low Earth orbit. Uh, we have learned how the human body reacts to the microgravity uh, environment, and we're still learning, I might say. Uh, and we have grown food, crystallized proteins, we've launched satellites and conducted scientific observations of the Earth and the stars above. Uh, during the 115th Congress, I introduced the Leading Human Spaceflight Act, which, among other provisions, would, have, uh, would, it, uh, would extend the authorization of the ISS from, 20, from uh, 2024 to 2030. And I would note that this extension would not simply swap out dates. Rather, my bill would also call for an earlier termination of federal support for the ISS if a commercial alternative is in place prior to 2030. It is vital to not only our leadership in space, but also our national security that America maintain a continual, uninterrupted human presence in low Earth orbit. I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, to ensure that we prevent another damaging capability gap like the one we experienced at the conclusion of our space shuttle program. All of that being said, it is very important to note that our financial resources for space activities are limited, and any decision on ISS extension will result in some trade-offs. NASA has previously estimated that the ISS will cost taxpayers between three and four billion dollars annually through 2024, roughly half of NASA's total human spaceflight budget. Each dollar spent on transportation to and maintenance of the ISS is a dollar that is not being spent 
on exploration beyond low Earth orbit, whether it is to the moon, to Mars, or other destinations. Numerous reports from the National Academies and the NASA Inspector General have concluded that an extension of the ISS could result in a multi-year delay to future deep space missions. So I proudly represent the Johnson Space Center, uh, which manages both the ISS and the Orion programs. So I am especially aware of the trades that we have to make between low Earth orbit and deep space exploration. Aside from today's discussion of the ISS, we will also hear from our witnesses about ongoing efforts to increase commercial activities in low Earth orbit. NASA has engaged in a lot of work over the last three years to examine potential markets and the capacity for them. They've commissioned think tank studies, sought input from industry, and researched the various architectures at length. This work informed their recent announcement on ISS commercialization last month. Our witnesses today will share their thoughts on how, the, how NASA can continue to work with industry to find opportunities to develop more commercial markets in low Earth orbit. Section 303 of the 2017 NASA, uh, NASA Transition Authorization Act directed NASA to, uh, to conduct a transition report for ISS where NASA would be one of many customers of a low Earth orbit commercial human spaceflight enterprise. A future where NASA is able to act as a customer and purchase a variety of services will allow the agency to focus on more ambitious deep space missions, and I look very much forward to hearing from our witnesses uh, how this committee can help take, uh, make this st uh, step happen. And uh, allowing NASA to serve as a customer rather than a developer of basic services is a very fiscally responsible move that will benefit the taxpayer and industry alike. I want to thank today's witnesses for being with us, and I look forward to your discussion. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, and the Chair now recognizes the Chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Johnson, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Horn and Ranking Member Babin, for holding this hearing to consider NASA's plans for the International Space Station and future activities in low Earth orbit. As I have noted in the past, the International Space Station is the largest and most complex science and engineering project ever carried out in space. It plays a critical role in carrying out human health and technological research that is essential if we are to successfully send astronauts to Mars and back. The ISS also serves as a laboratory for the fundamental and applied science as well as an observation platform for astronomical, environmental, and heliophysics research. It has been an enduring example of international cooperation in space, and it continues to inspire young people to excel and to provide opportunities for classrooms across our nation to interact with our astronauts through the live communication downlinks. Yet the ISS is a limited resource with a limited lifetime, and we need to make sure that we make the best use of it while we have it. And to me, that means making sure that its highest priority is carrying out the research and engineering test bed activities that can only be done in ISS. That is, the lens through which I will be looking at NASA's proposals for ISS commercial activities. I support efforts to create a vibrant commercial space economy and low Earth orbit, but ultimately, it is the private sector that will determine whether or not that will happen. Private investment will be needed, not government sub subsidies. If LEO commercial commercialization is to be sustainable over the long term, I believe that the jury is still out as to whether that will happen. In the meantime, the International Space Station has a limited lifetime, limited crew size, and limited research capabilities. As I said earlier, we need to ensure that those resources are focused on those tasks that can only be done by ISS and that are a high priority. As a result, it will be taking a, we will be taking a close look at NASA's proposed commercialization initiative to see whether it meets that standard. 
At this point, I'm not convinced that it does. For example, I'm skeptical that sending wealthy space tourists to ISS is the best or even a good use of taxpayers' funded facility. NASA keeps saying that there are unanswered human health research questions that can only be addressed on the ISS. Questions that need to be answered if we are to reduce the risk of sending humans to Mars. If that is the case, our focus should be on sending additional crew members or researchers to the station, not well-heeled individuals seeking exotic vacation. We have much to discuss today, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I welcome our witnesses. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. And let me extend my warm welcome as well again to the witnesses. We have a distinguished panel today and clearly we have a lot to discuss as, as we're moving into this next phase to address uh, concerns as we move forward to prevent, as my colleague said, a capability gap in this important endeavor. Uh, I'll begin by introducing our witnesses today. Our first witness, uh, Mr. William Gerson Meyer, uh, is no stranger to uh, appearing before this uh, committee, and we're, we're glad to have you here today. Associate, Administra Associate Administrator for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA. Prior to his current position, Mr. Gerson Meyer served as the manager for the International Space Station Program. He also served as the Associate Administrator for the Space Operations Mission Directorate during the completion of the space station. Mr. Gerstenmeier holds a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Engineering from Purdue University and a Master of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toledo. He is becoming a regular when it comes to testifying before us and clearly has uh, has expertise related to ISS, and we are glad to see you again, and we appreciate you being here as we consider these important issues. So welcome, Mr. Gerstenmeier. Our next witness, uh, Mr. Paul Martin, Inspector General for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Mr. Martin has been uh, NASA Inspector General since Senate confirmation in 2009. Prior to his appointment at NASA, he served as the Deputy Inspector General in the Department of Justice. He also spent 13 years at the U.S. Sentencing Commission, including six years as the Commission's Deputy Staff Director. Mr. Martin received a BA in Journalism from Pennsylvania State University and a Juris Doctorate from Georgetown University Law Center. We look forward to your testimony today, Mr. Martin, and we're glad that you're here, so welcome. Our next witness is Mr. Eric Stalmer. Um, Mr. Stalmer uh, is the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, CSF, and has much experience in the commercial space sector. Uh, CSF is uh, the, uh, an organization, a trade organization dedicated to promoting the development of commercial space flight and was recently appointed to the National Space Council User Advisory Group. Before working at the Commercial Space Flight Federation, Mr. Salmer served as the Vice President of Government Relations for Analytical Graphics Incorporated. Mr. Stalmer has a bachelor's degree in political science and history from Mount St. Mary College and a master's in public administration from George Mason University. Mr. Stalmer also testified yesterday before our colleagues in the Senate, and so you've had a long two days, uh, So, but we're glad that you're joining us today and appreciate your willingness to, to do back-to-back -back, uh, hearings in, the, in 24 hours. So welcome, I'm glad to have you here. And our last witness is Professor Joanne Irene Gabrenowitz. Did I get it right? Excellent. I know Gerst. I just want to make sure I get it right. So Professor, uh, Professor Gabrinowitz is a professor emerita of space law and director of the National Center for Remote Sensing Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi Law Center. Professor Gabrinowitz is also the editor-in-chief emerita of the Journal of Space Law. In addition, she is a director of the International Institute of Space Law, and is an official observer for the IISL of the, to the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. She received her bachelor's from City University of New York and earned her Juris Doctorate from the Cardozo School of Law. Welcome, Dr. B Professor Gabrinowitz. 
As our witnesses, you should all know that each of you will have uh, five minutes uh, to for your spoken testimony and your written testimony will be included in the record for this hearing. When you've completed your spoken testimony, we'll begin with questions and each member will have five minutes uh, of questions. And since you've, you've been through this drill many times before, uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. Um, ISS is the most amazing and productive space research facility ever constructed by humankind. ISS is accomplishing more than previously envisioned. For example, ISS's role in CubeSat, Cube satellite deployment and development was un unanticipated. Who would have thought that ISS and its relatively low altitude would be seen as the go-to CubeSat deployment platform? The CubeSat lifetime is on the order of months at the altitude of the space station. The lifetime constraint would seem to reduce CubeSat developers' desire to use the space station. The cost of access to ISS and the ability of crews to interact with the satellites prior to deployment made ISS a great research platform for CubeSats. As of today, 250 <coughs> 250 CubeSats have been deployed from the ISS. ISS has played a pivotal role in the development of the CubeSat market. ISS also played a strong role in lowering launch costs. Cargo transportation to, allow, to ISS allowed for new competition to enter the launch market. ISS cargo with relaxed launch reliability requirements allowed new competition in launch vehicles and helped bring commercial satellite launch back to the U.S. soil. Clearly, this role for ISS was not envisioned at the beginning of ISS. Lastly, the ISS International Partnership has allowed the ISS team to set interoperability standards for the rest of the world to follow. The international docking standards allows anyone building to the standard to dock with the ISS. The standard does not dictate design, but allows for docking. There are now standards for life support, power, data, and avionics. The ISS team is setting standards for the rest of the world to follow in human spaceflight. These standards will be used for our lunar activity. Today's hearing discussing future plans for the ISS is very timely. Just as the activities that I mentioned have surprised us in the benefits from ISS, I think the upcoming years of ISS operations offer the chance to see ISS contribute in ways not yet envisioned or imagined. The area that I would like to discuss in my opening remarks is the ISS activity associated with creating a commercial market for low Earth orbit activities. Several weeks ago, NASA announced a plan to utilize ISS to explore market development in low Earth orbit. Previously, NASA asked commercial industry for their ideas to commercialize low Earth orbit. And based on the input from 12 studies and 12 companies, <coughs> NASA developed a plan. That plan comprises five key areas. First, to establish ISS commercial use and, pol and pricing policy. That allows the commercial companies to understand where they can use ISS and how much it will cost. The second point was to enable private astronaut missions to the ISS. The third point was to initiate a process of commercial development of low Earth orbit destination. This means allowing the docking port to be used on ISS for commercial activities and also investing, investigating new free flying platforms. Fourth, we were seeking out and pursuing opportunities to stimulate demand. And fifth, we've been quantifying NASA's long-term needs for activities in low Earth orbit. With this data, commercial companies should be able to build a business plan and determine ways to generate revenue from low Earth orbit. NASA can enable U.S. industry to see the benefits and opportunities in low Earth orbit spaceflight. However, the results will only come from the private sector investing and taking risks. All companies investing in low Earth orbit will not be successful. It is critical that NASA create the right environment for these potential low Earth orbit <coughs> entrepreneurs. The ultimate goal is for NASA to become one of many customers for activities in low Earth orbit. Being one of many customers will lower costs for NASA and allow us to more effectively use the dollars that we have been provided. I stress that the burden of creating this new market will be on the private sector and not on NASA. Again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kirsten Meyer. Um, Mr. Martin. Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, and members of the subcommittee, over the past five years, the Office of Inspector General has issued 13 reports related to the International Space Station, including reviews of NASA's efforts to maximize onboard research, 
manage the $17 billion in contracts with private companies to fly cargo and crew, and maintain international partnerships that fund almost one quarter of the station's annual expenses. My testimony today is informed by these past reviews, in particular an audit we issued last July that assessed NASA's utilization of the ISS. For the past 21 years, the ISS has served as a unique platform for humans to experience living in space while conducting research in a microgravity environment. But while a unique platform, it's also an expensive platform that costs NASA between three to four billion dollars annually, or about half its human spaceflight budget. In my remarks this morning, I offer three observations based on our oversight work. Observation one, NASA's current plans for a more incremental approach to ISS commercialization appear more realistic than its previous approach that set a hard deadline of October 2025 to end direct federal funding for the station. That said, we continue to question whether a sufficient business case exists under which private companies can create a self-sustaining and profit-making business using the ISS independent of significant government funding in the short or midterm. From our perspective, it is unlikely that a private entity would assume the station's operating cost, currently $1.2 billion annually, to enable NASA to achieve its stated goal of, quote, becoming one of many customers of a commercial LEO platform. Observation two. Structurally, it appears the service life of the ISS could safely be extended to at least 2028, if not beyond. However, the larger challenge may be the yearly expense of oper operating the station past 2024, an expense that may impact NASA's ability to fund other priorities. Unless the agency receives a substantial and sustained appropriations increase, it will be hard-pressed to continue supporting ISS operations under its current model while also funding initiatives such as the Gateway, lunar landers, new spacesuits, and other technologies required for a moon landing. Observation 3. Last month, NASA announced an interim directive outlining use of the ISS for commercial and marketing activities. To help companies develop business plans, NASA also published a pricing policy under which it plans to charge private astronauts around $1 million for a month-long stay on the ISS, or about $35,000 per day. While NASA acknowledges these prices are substantially subsidized and represent only a small portion of the agency's actual costs, the initiative is one approach NASA is undertaking to foster a commercial market in low Earth orbit. The likelihood of success of this effort remains unclear for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is uncertainty about when routine commercial crew flights to the ISS will begin and how much a seat will cost a private astronaut. In conclusion, one positive benefit of the administration's FY 2019 plan to end direct federal funding of the ISS after 2024 was that it helped focus the conversation about the station's future. Whether the final decision is extension, increased commercialization, retirement, or some combination of these options, the sooner the administration and Congress agree on a definitive path forward for the ISS, the better NASA will be able to maximize use of the station and make additional plans to commercialize low Earth orbit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Mr. Stalmer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting the Commercial Space Flight Federation to discuss our members' views on the state of the U.S. commercial space industry. We also appreciate the opportunity to review NASA's plans for the International Space Station and examine future activities in low Earth orbit. In, in addition to NASA's utilization of the ISS, the United States now has a vibrant, highly capable commercial space sector that is beginning to maximize the utility of the ISS and is demonstrating a growing LEO economy. As we look to the future, in which the government is one of many customers, 
it needs to be reduced. It needs to reduce the burdens on the system and moves at the speed of at the speed of business. Because of NASA's foresight and cultivation of this industry, American companies support space exploration and national security needs today, in addition to the commercial marketplace. Unlike when the first pieces of the ISS were being launched into LEO, we now have an exciting and diverse commercial marketplace, one which NASA can partner to achieve its goals. 20 years after Americans launched the first module of ISS, the current administration, NASA, and Congress have established a national commitment to ensure American leadership in low Earth orbit, to establish a permanent human presence in low Earth orbit, and enable the development of a commercial and industrial ecosystem. Long-term sustainable human presence and commercial activity in LEO requires an integrated effort. This includes stimulating greater demand for space-based industrial R&D and spaceflight products and services to LEO the development of commercial space stations and space habitats, and routine transportation of astronauts and cargo to and from LEO. Public-private partnerships with commercial cap companies are fundamental to developing these capabilities. As you look to ensure America's leadership in space, you must ensure we inc this includes rapid innovation. Last month, NASA released guidance for its LEO, econo Leo economy initiative. CSF commends Administrator Bridenstine and the entire NASA team for recognizing the success of the commercial industry, incorporating best practices, and updating objectives to accelerate the development of these important capabilities. As NASA works to implement this initiative, we recommend the following uh, few ideas. Encourage NASA to adopt the best elements of its successful efforts to commercialize space, such as the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, COTS program, and the Commercial Crew program. Maintain co uh, competition throughout the life of a program to encourage innovation and cost reduction. Multiple providers offer redundant capabilities in the, in the event of delays or challenges. Support of a complete utilization of the ISS through at least 2028 and a timely, seamless transition process towards commercial space stations to ensure that the U.S. maintains a continuous human presence in low Earth orbit. Provide certainty and predictability by communicating a clear plan for the transition to commercial systems. That means that if NASA is going to charge for ISS-related services, those prices should change infrequently and with, the subs and with substantive advance notice. And resist the temptation to try to make money now at the expense of future LEO market expansion. This would be the very definition of killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. Regularly engage with industry, which NASA does a great job with, to understand and incorporate new commercial capabilities as they evolve, as opposed to requesting, the business, uh, requesting that business fit within NASA's plans. Grant users complete control over an intellectual property and developed on ISS and avoid competing with private industry. We are ready to take the next step with NASA, and we look forward to continuing to work with this committee to establish a permanent human presence in low Earth orbit and enable the development of a strong commercial ecosystem. Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, I really, and members of the committee, I really appreciate the invitation to testify before you today, and I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to all your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Stalmer. Uh, Professor Gabrinowitz. Thank you. Chairwoman Horn, Ranking Member Babin, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address NASA's plans for the International Space Station and future activities in low Earth orbit. I am delighted to respond. My full statement has been submitted for the record. This statement addresses two points of space law that are particularly germane to plans to develop low Earth orbit and the station. They speak directly to U.S. national interests, and there is a brief conclusion. The first point is that the U.S. government is internationally responsible for the activities of its non-governmental space actors in perpetuity. The second point is that the legal obligations of the U.S. government continue in force even after the transfer of station elements to non-governmental commercial activities. Regarding the first point, that the United States is internationally responsible for its <clears throat> non-governmental space actors, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty provides that states' parties shall bear 
international responsibility for activities carried on by non-governmental entities. It is crucial that Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty become central to the plans for commercial LEO development. What constitutes responsibility is part of a growing body of law that has strengthened and matured in recent years. The United States government, and through it, the United States taxpayer, will ultimately be responsible if it is deemed necessary because of events uh, will ultimately be deemed re responsible for reparation if it is deemed necessary because of events arising from U.S. non-governmental activities. The government's responsibility exists in perpetuity. Withdrawing from or altering the Outer Space Treaty can change this, but that is an option that is not favored either by the space industry itself or by the United States Department of State. A risk-sharing regime has been established for launch and reentry services. An analogous risk-sharing regime should be developed for all stages of the planned human exploration roadmap in which non-governmental actors will be part of the roadmap space activities. The second legal point is that the United States space station obligations remain in force even after transfer of station elements to non-governmental commercial entities. The IGA, the Space Station Agreement, is a remarkable space law achievement. It has governed space station cooperation for 15 states over three decades, and it is described in more depth in my statement. An essential feature of the Space Station Agreement is that the transfer of ownership shall, and I quote, the transfer of ownership shall not affect the rights and obligations of the parties, end quote. Therefore, if the space station transition will include, quote, transfer of all or parts of the station itself to commercial entities, including exercise of ownership or equipment, end quote, then the United States will still have the same rights and obligations that were in force prior to the transfer. Changing post-transfer obligations will require, at a minimum, renegotiating post-transfer rights and obligations among space station partners. This moves the issue of U.S. post-transfer obligations more into the realm of politics than law, increasing uncertainty regarding the degree, the nature, and the duration of U.S. obligations. In conclusion, there are legal and economic forces at play that can expose the United States government and the U.S. taxpayer to substantial, reoccurring, long-term obligations that can result in hard-to-quantify financial obligations. Development of low Earth orbit and the station is beginning at a time when the current value of the space economy is being questioned. When re when recent U.S. national space law increasingly places more of the cost of industry risk-taking onto the U.S. taxpayer, and when recently enacted U.S. national space law has created an uncertain legal environment by the use of illusory language that is mostly aspiration, aspirational and repetitive and creates little black-letter law. It is in the U.S. national interest for the subcommittee to consider these forces going forward. Thank you for your work to develop the law of space. Thank you, Dr. Gabrinowitz. And before we move into questions, I'm gonna take a moment of personal privilege uh, to, enter, to recognize two young women that are here today who I think are attending their second hearing in two days. Um, and as we talk about these important issues, we have uh, Elsa and Phaedra Curry, who have, I know grown up in, in this area, that we talk about the importance of investing in the future and inspiring future generations. So I just wanna take a moment, go ahead and stand up and say hello. Yeah. This could be our next generation of, of, of scientists. Okay. Now, at this point, we'll begin our first round of questions. Um, so, clearly, there are many issues that we have to tackle, and it's important that we, as we're looking forward, we take all of these things into account about how we, how we do this in a way that is sustainable, that is fiscally responsible, that encourages economic development, that allows NASA to move to a new 
iteration of what it means for us to explore and do science in space. So I'm going to try to get through a number of questions and as quickly as possible because I think we've got a lot of important issues to tackle. So um, Mr. Gerstenmeier, Mr. Gerstenmeier, I would like to start with you because when we're tra considering this transition and how we're going to ensure that our nat national interests and activities in low Earth orbit can continue without, as uh, uh, Ranking Member Babin put it, a capabilities gap. I think that's one of the major questions that we have to face, as well as the legal issues and how we make that transition. There are many questions that need to be answered. I'm going to run through a few of them, and uh, uh, we'll submit some for the record, but highlight a couple just to set the stage. Uh, one, what are the what are the costs to NASA and international partners of NASA's proposal proposal to transition its ISS activities to a potential commercial space station? Two, have you carried out a cost benefit analysis of all of the potential options for an ISS transition, including a NASA developed smaller follow on platform to handle NASA and international partner research? Three, did you carry out a market analysis of commercial activity in low Earth orbit? Four, what is the value proposition for the U.S. taxpayer of NASA's planned investments in stimulating commercial LEO market supply and demand? Uh, five, how much is the commercial sector willing to invest? Who would own a commercial platform and who would own the data from NASA research conducted on a commercial space station? How much money would the commercial plan save as compared to NASA's current ISS expenditures, and when would those savings be realized? And finally, what is the plan B if commercial platforms or alternative mo models of ISS operations don't prove feasible, technically, or feasible either technically or financially? So those are the, the stage setting. I, I'd, I'd ask uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier if you would address if you've carried out a cost-benefit analysis and if, if you know how much the commercial sector is willing to invest. And Mr. Stalmer, I'd ask that second question uh, of you uh, to follow on. So the way we're kind of approaching this is last month, we first of all, we spent one year asking the commercial sector what their interests were in low Earth orbit and what they needed from NASA to understand the environment. And what we got clearly from those 12 studies was there was lots of uncertainty about what was available, what the constructs were, what they could do on station, how much it would cost, those kind of things. So what we did a month ago is we tried to define for them all these key parameters that they said they needed through these studies. So we gave them the five things I described to you that they have available. Now it's up to them to see if they can put together a business plan, generate revenue from that, where they see the market potential. We define what NASA's long-term needs there, what NASA needs to spend annually for space station activities in the future. So we believe we've given the private sector now all the parameters they need to give us back a business plan, and then we can start to begin to answer those series of questions that you ask us about cost benefit and analysis, et cetera. So we've done our part. We've identified what's available, what we need, how much it'll cost to find the constraints. It's now up to the private sector to give us back business plans that we can then start evaluating to turn that back around into the, the cost benefit analysis type of activities you described. Thank you. Mr. Stalmer. From a commercial perspective, since 2000, right around the time that the, the space station um, was, it became functional. Uh, the, the private sector has invested $20 billion, and much of that uh, investment has gone to low Earth orbit. Uh, as we're projecting on what the, the rate of return it will be for the shuttle, well, given NASA's investment cost, uh, the global space community right now, the worldwide figures, I, I think, are range anywhere from 360 to $380 billion of the global space economy. Uh, within the next decade, um, several major institutions, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, or, or I'm sorry, Morgan Stanley, and, and others, have projected the, the, the commercial marketplace or the global space marketplace, which is all space, to be a trillion-dollar business. So, you know, short of the business plans that I, I don't have them in hand to, to uh, present to NASA right now, but the companies that are working with the International, International Space Station on the International Space Station are projecting this, I think, into the future. Um, but I think the most important thing is the stability of knowing that the station will be there um, the beyond. Uh, it, it's hard to do a business plan for uh, something that may not exist, and how do you project out? So if we're talking about you know the space station going away 2024, 
Well, that's, that's four and a half years from now. If we can do 2028 or beyond, I think it makes for a better case for investment. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Gabrunowitz, I think you hit on a couple of very important points, and I just want to reiterate um, and, and ask a question about your observation regarding the legal challenges in the next generation of what we're looking at, and that the development of LEO and ISS is beginning at a time when the current value of the space economy is being questioned. Uh, but to get to the last part of it, right at the heart, where the risk and reward and, and the, the liability lies, that the space law has created and the movement has created an uncertain legal environment that is that there's very little black letter law. And so my question to you is, what do you see as an effective pathway to addressing those issues and creating an effective and enforceable body of law? Excuse me, just a moment. Well, to begin with, if we have black letter law, it is law that actually authorizes, requires, or prohibits action. What we have had since about 2014, 2015, are a number of statutes that rely on reaffirmations, uh, the sense of Congress provisions. Uh, none of these create law. There's a pattern in these statutes where um, there's a congressional finding or the sense of Congress is, and then uh, the requirement is to produce a study and to bring it back to the relevant committee. And so there's a lot of activity going back and forth, excuse me, uh, regarding studies that are intended for future action. But most of these statutes don't actually authorize prohibit or, or source action. And uh, if one were to go over these statutes, uh, you'd see large chunks of uh, numbered pages that are simply opinions and not law. Even a sense of Congress provision, even if it's in incorporated into a bill, it does not create law. And um, I don't remember the numbers now, but I've gone through the, these statutes and, uh, statutes, and a number of them have 15, 20 cents of Congress provisions in one bill. Thank you very much. I have many more questions, but we're going to pass the time, so turn it over to Ranking Member Babin for his. NASA just released details highlighting its plans for the low Earth orbit commercialization. The intent of the plan is to facilitate private sector use of low Earth orbit to offset the government's costs in LEO so that NASA can focus on deep space exploration. And the focus of the plan appears to be focused on selling access to the ISS. And uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, will this offset NASA's costs uh, for ISS transportation and operations? And if so, by how much? And if not, then why decrease uh, NASA's utilization? Yeah, so the intent is not to lower NASA's costs for this activity. The idea is to essentially allow the commercial sector to experiment with revenue generating activities on board station. And for that, we want to recoup some of the costs associated with the activities of which they're using on station. And that was the pricing policy that we placed for them. It's not an absolute pricing policy, but it's a, it gives them an idea of how to build a plan. And the idea is then can they then look at from that, determine whether a private station on their own that they built could be used, and then that's something that NASA could then acquire services from in the future. Okay. So the purpose of that was to allow them to essentially experiment with revenue generating options and concepts moving forward. And we didn't take things away. We, were, we made available to them 5% of the available time on ISS, and that 5% we can we can remove from our other activities and move forward. So we still protect our basic research. We still protect the fundamental research needed for exploration and human health and other aspects. Okay. Will, will revenue derived from the ISS commercialization plan go back to the Treasury, or will it stay with NASA? And what oversight will Congress and the taxpayer have on funds derived from the taxpayer's significant investment in the ISS? 
Again, our focus early isn't on capturing revenue. The okay. intent is to allow them to experiment, and sure. then, then later in the future, where they now have their space station to serve other purposes other than the government's purpose, then we're one user of many, then we're buying from a larger service, and that lowers our cost for future activities. But the intent is not to generate revenue. I understand. Sense. And uh, Mr. Martin, uh, recent reports from your office have highlighted the need to develop new spacesuits both for future use in the microgravity environment of LEO for extravehicular operations uh, and for future deep space missions and surface operations. Our current extravehicular mobile mobility units were designed in the late 70s. Uh, astronauts have nearly drowned from water leaking into their helmets and the current astronaut corps would very much benefit from a, large, uh, a larger variety of suit sizes. Future spacesuits for surface operations were postponed years ago after a contract protest and deferments under the previous administration. How important is the ISS for NASA's testing of the next generation of spacesuits? It's critical. It's critical for testing the okay. EMUs, and I think NASA has a plan to get the next, called the X EMU suit, up on station by 2023. Okay, great. Thank you. Good news. And then, uh, Mr. Stalmer, uh, recent IG reports and a report from the Science and Technology Policy Institute were pessimistic about the potential uh, of the private sector offsetting government's funding in LEO. Can you comment on the private sector's perspective of LEO commercialization, and is this something that the private sector could provide private capital for, or does the private sector see this as another opportunity for more government money? Uh, yes, I, I saw that report, and I, I somewhat disagree with the assessment, of the, the pessimism of what markets are there. Uh, as we're talking about offsets, I don't think the station was designed as this, this economic uh, engine, you know, for uh, in low Earth orbit. It, it started off as a scientific platform. But I do see the investment that the private sector community is making. Um, for, for instance, the Space Angels Network, which is a, uh, started off as a small group of uh, small investors in space, uh, making minimal, uh, smaller uh, investments is now over 200 in, uh, individual investors that are investing in these companies that are going to be doing work on the International Space Station. So I don't see a, a trend of companies coming up uh, up to the hill to ask for more and more money for the station. I think it's what, what we're looking for is stable policies that we know that we can work within the boundaries of Excellent. the space station. So Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Gabrinowitz. Uh, NASA's plans allow for private astronauts on the ISS. Current law allows for government astronauts under the current statute. Uh, what is a private astronaut under the current statute, and what are the differences in these names from a practical perspective and also from a legal perspective? Thank you. I'll get this right before the end of the hearing. I'll be here for you. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, as the uh, designations indicate, uh, a government um, uh, astronaut is an employee of the federal government, and as such, uh, there are uh, legal um, rights and privileges that astronaut has and restrictions. It's roughly analogous to being a member of the military. You have certain rights and obligations that a civilian does not have. Uh, a private astronaut, it would not be a government employee. Uh, their relationship would be based on who, for whom they work or if they work for themselves, uh, at whose direction are they uh, taking uh, instruction, are they acting as an agent for uh, an entity, and therefore that person's rights and obligations are going to arise from that uh, relationship. But then there's the additional overlay that if you have a private sector astronaut who is a non-governmental actor, then uh, ultimately the United States is responsible for that uh, astronaut anyway, there's that additional overlay. And I just want to give you a little background as to why that responsibility exists, because it's very important to the United States values. When the Outer Space Treaty was being negotiated, it was the position of the Soviet Union that only nation states were legitimate space actors. 
And of course, the United States couldn't agree to that and said, no, private entities are also legitimate state actors. Well, a compromise was made between the Soviet and the American position, and that compromise was that non-governmental space actors will be authorized and continually supervised by the nation that is party to the treaty. So that supervision, that authorization, is the source of the right of the private sector to be in space. And the flip side of that coin is uh, because they have to be authorized and continually supervised, they are, um, the, the United States is internationally responsible for them. So that responsibility goes hand in hand with American values of private activity. Absolutely, thank you, very fascinating, appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much and, and thank you, Dr. Babin. I think it, w one of the things that is, is clear from the questions for me is that you, you asked many of the remaining questions I had that very, very important, although there are more that these are clearly a, very much a bipartisan issue in the best interest of NASA. Um, and the chair recognizes uh, Chairwoman Johnson for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, in line with the questioning that just happened, uh, Professor um, Gobern Joanne Brenowitz, uh, as we consider the administration's proposal for the ISS commercialization, I was struck by your statement that there are legal and economic forces at play that can expose the U.S. government and the U.S. taxpayer to substantial recurring and long-term obligations that can result in hard to, qu to quantify financial obligations. What do you think are the most significant potential financial obligations that need to be considered before we sign off on NASA's commercialization proposals? And what legal risk uh, are we concerned, or we should be concerned, that the U.S. government might be assuming? Now I got it right, okay. Um, the, I cannot speak to what are the most significant risks. Those are engineering and science questions. And I would have to uh, direct you to speak to uh, the engineers and the, and the scientists who would tell you where the risk is, what can go wrong um, in terms of science and engineering. Um, in terms of what the United States would be responsible for, again, th this is why it's unknown. This is all going to be very fact dependent on what happens when, where, and what the results are. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the, the elements in, of the space station are registered by the nations who put them in there. So if you're in the American, one of the American mo modules and you go to the Japanese module, you're going from a place where US national law applies to a place where Japanese law applies. They're like little tiny embassies. Well, not so tiny, they're pretty big. But um, it's gonna be very, they make great hypothetical questions on my exams uh, because it's, <laughs> it's very fact dependent as to what the US has to be uh, prepared for. But the bottom line is there must be the awareness that under the Outer Space Treaty, the United States is internationally responsible for whatever that fact pattern may arise to be. And under the Space Station Agreement, uh, the obligations will continue after transfer unless there is a, a new agreement reached with the partners that supersedes the current Space Station Agreement. Thank you very much. Mr. Gerstenmaier, reducing the risk of human missions to Mars and other destinations have long been a prime justification for continuing operations for the ISS. Uh, Mr. Martin's prepared testimony notes that there are a series of human health risk and technology gaps required for future missions to the moon and Mars that will not be completed on the ISS by the mid-2020s. At the same time, NASA's low Earth orbit commercial development plans propose providing commercial entities access to NASA's available crew time, power, and other resources that otherwise could be used to make progress on the human health 
and Technology Research. Given the limited life of the ISS, how do you justify using NASA's constrained ISS resources to try to stimulate commercial activities such as space tourism and marketing rather than using these resources to reduce the risk of human missions to Mars? We are very focused on reducing the risk associated with Mars, both technically and also from a human uh, physiology standpoint. That is our primary focus. We're spending a lot of research time on both of those activities. But what we've done is we've created this 5% piece beyond that of which we can allow this experimentation and commercialization. And we think that's important because then at some point this station will wear out. We've identified a long-term need for us to do this technology development and research in the future. We're going to need some other facility to do that. What we'd like to do is not be in the posture where NASA and the U.S. government has to build that facility. We would like to be able to use a private facility. So we think this small portion of the time being available to prepare for that future allows us to ensure that we can keep a research facility in low Earth orbit to investigate the technology and the human factors we need to get ready to go to Mars. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The chair now recognizes a full committee ranking member, Lucas, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Gerstermeyer, let's step back and look at a kind of a more of a broader perspective. NASA recently released summaries of the private sector's low Earth orbit commercialization plans. Did NASA learn anything from these studies that it did not expect? Were you surprised by anything? Yes, I, I think the, the takeaway that we saw from the plans were the, the diversity in the options of, of what the companies thought for revenue generation, what they thought the cost would be associated. There were a, a lot of differing opinions from their perspective of what they saw the benefits of space research were. So I think the diversity of the responses we got surprised us. We thought they would be more aligned in one specific area. So that's why we pursued this five-point plan I discussed. So I assume that was a pleasant surprise then. It's interesting, because, but it's hard for us now to pick then a concrete path to go forward from, from those studies. Along that line, uh, Mr. Kirstenmeyer, in 2015 we saw reports that the Russians intended to detach their modules in 2024 to form their own habitat in low Earth orbit. If, in the event this were to happen, how should the U.S. engage its international partners and along with that, uh, would a Russian departure from the ISS require further U.S. investment in ISS to keep it running without a Russian segment? I think that's an interesting hypothetical discussion. There's lots of dependencies between the Russian segment and the U.S. segment. Uh, we provide power to them. We provide approximately 1,000 commands today go through USS, U.S. assets, and those are Russian commands going to their side. So I think in reality, we're going to have to stay together as an international partnership, whether we really want to or not. And we can talk about things hypothetically, but in reality, we're part of the international partnership that needs to work together and will continue to work together in the future. So we're hooked at the hip then. That makes sense. Mr. Tolmeyer, does maintaining a presence in low Earth orbit necessarily mean the presence must be a NASA presence? Or could American companies maintain that presence? And along that line, does maintaining any sort of crew presence in low Earth orbit necessarily mean maintaining a presence on, on the ISS in particular? Uh, sir, I, I think it's both. I, I think that NASA should um, re retain a, a permanent presence uh, in low Earth orbit, but I think there's also a commercial element as we're seeing uh, private sector habitats being developed and private, potentially private space stations being developed, I think you can have it both ways. I think the co uh, commercial sector will ser um, provide services, and I think NASA eventually will be a customer of those services. So I think it's a, it's a good balance that we uh, have to look forward to. Thank you. And Madam Chair, using my time, pre precious time precisely, I now yield back the balance. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Chris for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, panelists, for being with us today. Uh, I think we can all agree that performing research in microgravity is critical to achieving scientific and technological advances, which is why I support an extension of space station operations beyond 2024. 
However, uh, there will eventually come a time when the station is no longer usable simply because it has reached its operational lifespan. Uh, Mr. Gertesmeyer, and I apologize if I mispronounced it, uh, when this occurs, what do you envision for the future of microgravity research? Specifically, do you see the need for some sort of national space-based lab to support research and development beyond the useful life of the space station? Yeah, in, the, in the plans we provided to commercial industry, we identify what we believe is NASA's long-term needs for space research, and included in that is a continua continuation of doing research for NASA's need, both technology development and also microgravity research. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, to you, if you don't mind, I assume that increased commercialization of low Earth orbit will result in additional traffic to and from the station. Um, can you discuss NASA's plan for space traffic management under a commercialized low Earth orbit situation? Yeah, even today, we have a visiting vehicle specification that essentially defines the operating environment around space station. So we have certain zones where vehicles can transit and come into, but they need authority to come into those. So there's a very methodical approach of how we do vehicle traffic management in a way almost similar to an airport here terrestrially, but but it's around space station. And when I propose we would use that same kind of thing in the future for another space station or this space station as it moves forward. But it's becoming a very busy environment for us and uh, the monitoring and activities of the folks at the Johnson Space Center are critical for those activities. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Stalmer, as you know, NASA announced last month that it will allow two flights to the space station each year for private astronauts. Uh, do you believe it's feasible to begin these flights with an all-commercial astronaut crew, or would it be better to start with missions that include both NASA and private astronauts to help uh, build and establish this market? I think it would be the latter. I think uh, using NASA, NASA astronauts as well as commercial astronauts is a, is a prudent approach. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, in many different markets later this year, we're going to see uh, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin launch uh, commercial astronauts in a suborbital fashion. And of course, with the uh, uh, commercial crew program coming online, I think it's going to increase the access uh, to utilization of the space station. I think it's a great way of NASA leaning forward to try to greater utilize the International Space Station for commercial astronauts and the science they can do. I think if you look at it from a research perspective, if a, a private company pays for that astronaut to go up to the International Space Station and conduct studies, I think that's part of the economic engine that we're looking to develop uh, from uh, generating more and more revenue from the, the space station. So I think it's a very prudent approach uh, by NASA. Thank you. And then uh, my last question for any of the panelists. Uh, what, in your opinion, uh, can NASA do to help encourage a commercial astronaut transportation market? If you have an opinion. For NASA to encourage the, the greater utilization of commercial astronauts? Yes, sir. I, I think it's to highlight the opportunities for the science that is up there. I think when we see some of the breakthrough technologies, and NASA's done a, a great job of, of showcasing the breakthrough technologies that have been developed on the International Space Station. But if companies can see this as a, as a, a platform for, for research, whether it be um, pharmaceutical research or, or, or uh, as the Australians were talking about, having to be able to consume beer in space, you know, and, and, and they're working on that diligently. Um, or, or if it's just to, to, to the technology to hit a golf ball 10 yards further, I think, you know, understanding that, that, that the technology that microgravity offers, um, it's limitless on what we can do. So I think uh, as NASA, um, and, and the partnership with commercial uh, sector, I think working together to promote that and, and the possibilities, I think that's what's going to really encourage this market to grow. I guess a note of caution just to point out that any, uh, at least the initial steps of commercialization of low Earth orbit is heavily subsidized by NASA. So the, the figures, the cost figures that NASA put out, the $35,000 a day for an astronaut, a million dollars for a one month day, and that's extremely heavily subsidized, almost as a lost leader to get to entice and encourage the market. There's a few interesting biological things that are that are we've seen on station. I think have tremendous benefit. One is a lab. Uh, it's called essentially lab on a chip or biology on a chip. 
You, it turns out that for whatever reason, some functions are, happen faster in space, like uh, immune system degradation, et cetera. So there's a there's the idea that you can actually take liver cells, which are used to determine whether a pharmaceutical product will be toxic to you or not. And in the microgravity environment, because those processes are speeded up, it would typically take a year to get results on the Earth, can occur in several months on station. So we think there's a huge benefit, potentially, for pharmaceutical companies to bring drugs to market faster by doing this lab-on-a-chip kind of technology on station. We're also looking at 3D printing of organs in, step in space. Because there's no gravity, you don't have to have any material to make the organs actually uh, resist gravity. So now you can actually pr uh, print essentially organs of much larger size. So the idea is for us to expose the private sector to these interesting, innovative ideas that are transformative, and then let them take that through their ingenuity and innovativeness, and then turn that into a marketable product to move forward. But, but those are some of the aspects that are very intriguing. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chris. The chair now recognizes Mr. Brooks for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Stalmer. The National Lab is a key driver of private activity on board the International Space Station. What setbacks have you seen or experienced that have held back the commercialization of low Earth orbit um, ISS activities? I wouldn't say setbacks per se, uh, and I, I'm sure others can speak to technical setbacks that they may have had. Um, I, I see more of opportunities. Uh, I, I think from a timeline perspective, um, certainly maybe the funding questions and, and the, the timeline of the, uh, with the extension, um, streamlining some of the policies uh, that we're looking at in, in uh, some of the space policy directives on streamlining policies, uh, that's been slower than we, we would hope for. But from a more optimistic perspective, um, I see the, the progress that commercial industry has made. Um, when I, when I, one of the reports was cited uh, that were pessimistic of the growth of you know, on, on commercial industry. I also read a report about 10 years ago that was pessimistic about reusable launch vehicles. And five years later, now we had reusable launch vehicles. And the, now we have uh, over 22 uh, vehicles that were um, launched and, and, and re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. And we're reusing them again, reducing the cost to access to space. I see the growth in industry um, from what companies doing, startup companies, whether it be electric propulsion, you know, for a satellite, small satellite boost, or, or the things, you know, um, that are going on the space station. Companies like TechShot and uh, Space Tango about this manufacturing um, human cells and uh, things of that nature. So, will there be setbacks? And have there been? Absolutely. And, and there's there's different timetables. And I think we're moving at an aggressive pace. But I think we need to as a nation. I think we, for 50 years, as we celebrate uh, Apollo, you know, next week, and the, the, what we've done over the past 50 years, what we did 50 years ago, I, I think it's a little disappointing what we've done in the last 50 years. Not the space station is a remarkable, uh, modern marvel, and, and I'm not knocking that at all. But I think as a nation, we can do better. I think we can do a lot better, and I think, uh, and I know the commercial sector will be helping do that. This is a question for any who wish to opine on it. In your judgment, either in percentage terms or dollar terms, how much of a taxpayer subsidy is there for commercialization at the International Space Station? Over the past 12 to 14 years, NASA has invested approximately $17 billion dollars uh, to help the commercialization of both cargo transportation and crew transportation. That does not mean that the companies involved in both of those enterprises also don't have skin in the game. They have significant resources. But $17 billion investment in that, as we've all indicated, it costs upwards of 3 to $4 billion per year to maintain and operate the station. So as you can see, significant subsidies. My hometown is Huntsville, Alabama. We like to call ourselves the birthplace of the American space program. And as such, I've heard projections, uh, rather optimistic uh, on occasion, uh, that we're just around the corner uh, from having a commercialization of space that um, does not involve much in the way of taxpayer subsidies, either by our country or others, as the case may be, with a joint facility like the International Space Station. What needs to be done 
to truly make commercialization a solely private venture? Is there anything Congress can do where we can eliminate these taxpayer subsidies of these private efforts? I think when you, you categorize it as subsidies, I, I'd like to look at more of the advancements that the government assistance has created. And as we see, you know, for instance, on the, the, um, the commercial cargo program, with the government, you know, the, the, the investment that the government has made on that program, coupled with the investment of these private companies, we now have two uh, fully capable launch vehicles that are providing uh, routine access and routine you know, resupply to the International Space Station. So to put a price tag on that investment, well, now we have you know, the, um, these, these two vibrant, vibrant um, companies that are providing services, as well as uh, um, that we're going to see cargo with, with Boeing and SpaceX later, I'm um, sorry, crew with Boeing and SpaceX later this year. Uh, the U.S. dominates the, the global commercial marketplace now. Uh, you could not say that 10 years ago, where we had less than uh, less than 10 percent of the global market. So now the U.S. industry, on launch, on small sat, on spacecraft, we are the the dominant leader. So whatever that number of, of investment that the government has made, I think it is is paid you know tremendous dividends to the American public, and I think it'll continue to pay that with the investment that we have in the International Space Station. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. The chair now recognizes Congresswoman Hill for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Mr. Gerstenmeyer, earlier this year, NASA and partners worked to upgrade the batteries on the International Space Station to provide greater efficiency and power to the growing number of users on the station, as well as to prepare for continued upgrades in the years ahead. This is just the latest example of ongoing efforts that have been made to continue to improve ISS based on new technologies and grow its capabilities. What other efforts is NASA taking to improve power, life support systems, and other elements to ensure that ISS continues to support astronauts and science uh, needs for the years ahead? Today, we're actually testing the next generation of life support systems that will be used potentially on journeys to Mars. So they're much more efficient from a, from a water use standpoint, uh, recycling carbon dioxide. We've also just recently increased the bandwidth coming down from space station to 600 megabits per second. Um, that, is, that is now the standard every day, and we've increased the number of video channels coming down so we can do more interactive and uh, virtual reality activities with space station. So, so those are some of the examples of the improvements. And we have more battery upgrades coming this fall. Great, thank you. Um, also, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, as you know, the Senate has voted repeated, repeatedly to extend the ISS through at least 2030, and the majority of the House voted for a similar provision last year. As this issue comes up again in the new Congress, how important is certainty uh, of ISS extension to you, our international partners, and other users as they plan for crewed missions and experiments in the years ahead? You know, we just had a discussion on um, how, how we could uh, help commercial industry transfer or take over more of the role in low Earth orbit. I think that's very difficult to predict exactly when that's going to occur. I think that time frame is going to be hard. It's going to take longer to create a new economy than, than I think we've envisioned. So I think we need to be careful we don't set an arbitrary or artificial deadline. We need to essentially provide some certainty so industry and the commercial sector can understand what's coming in the future, they can plan for that, and then they can move forward. So I think getting a plan of how that moves forward and when that occurs, then we have a chance of, of envisioning this world where the commercial sector is taking a larger portion of the cost associated with low Earth orbit. And right now, we, we, don't have that, we don't have that certainty or that plan of transition. No, we have varying numbers depending on where we talk between what Congress says, the administration says, what NASA's plans are, et cetera. I think some certainty about that. But again, not setting an arbitrary deadline, but maybe more setting criteria such that we don't create this gap that was talked about earlier. The right. gap would be unacceptable, but we need uh, we need some plan to do that. Right. And um, Mr. Martin and Mr. Gerstenmeyer, I understand that NASA and partners have already worked to certify the ISS for use through at least 2028, and these studies indicated that its lifespan could extend well into the 2030s. Can you talk about that status, the status of these studies, and what other steps NASA is taking to ensure that ISS can be extended and healthy for many years? We, we've done uh, the structural studies through 2028. We've done other studies. These improvements I talked to you about earlier, those are all part of essentially allowing us to do more with station. These life support systems we're checking for the future, that actually allows us to have more crew on board station. The, the thing that we've got away again is 
you know, we are spending money in low Earth orbit that we could be spending in, in deep space. So we need to make sure that we have that right balance between those two moving forward. And I guess I would emphasize that these are opportunity costs. If you continue station for any number of years past 2024, that is approximately three to four billion dollars you don't have available to pursue other exploration goals, such as lander development, such as gateway, such as preparing and bending metal for moving to Mars. And so it is, it's, it's a choice. No one disputes that the ISS is just a, a critical element up there, but it's a question, again, absent substantial and sustained funding increase for NASA. Got it. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I really appreciate it, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Hill. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Posey for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier, what are the main cost drivers uh, for the three to four billion dollar operational cost of the ISS? The major cost driver is uh, crew and cargo transportation to and from ISS, and that's about the $1.8 billion of the, the $3 billion. That, that okay. Um, <clears throat> what factors affect the shelf life of the ISS? Again, I think we've been doing a pretty remarkable job of maintaining station and upgrading systems and components through use of our crews and astronauts and, and engineering expertise. There are some components structurally that may wear out over time, and we need to watch those and monitor those, but we're actively tracking those and, and looking at those on a what kind? Why, what kind of components would they be? They'd be some of those truss elements, some of the large structural pieces. Solar arrays uh, will need to be replaced at some point and augmented, and we have plans to do that. Okay. Uh, could uh, the ISS be mothballed? Space Station is, is designed to be crew operated, and so a lot of the systems really require a crew presence on board station. So, so essentially shutting station down and, and removing crew for an extended period of time would make it very difficult to ensure that we could bring the station back up when, when crew came forward or crew were available in the future. So it's not easy to essentially stop operations without the crew. We need to keep the crew presence on board station to keep the vehicle maintained. Uh, would it be feasible, even remotely, uh, to relocate the ISS, say, to an orbit around the, the moon? We, we've looked at that. It's, it's attractive, but physically it just doesn't seem practical. The amount of energy to, to do that isn't there. Um, the number of orbits, if you even low propulsion, you'd have to circle through the Van Allen belts multiple times over multiple months. And, and by the time you get there, there's, there's not physically possible to, to maneuver large pieces of station. You might be able to, to deconstruct and use small pieces of station, but generally you're probably going to want to use those small pieces in the same roughly inclination orbit that space station is in today. Okay. Uh, Mr. Martin, you mentioned that we've invested about 17 billion in the ISS. 17 billion in commercial cargo and crew transportation. Okay. Significantly more in the ISS, upwards of the numbers, to what you're counting, but it could be 80 billion to 100 billion over the 21 year life of the station. Okay. Uh, what kind of investments have our partners made? The international partners pay for approximately 23% of annual station costs. Okay. Now, Mr. Stallmer, from an industry perspective, uh, how has the public-private partnership uh, benefited the ISS and uh, LEO missions? I think it's greatly uh, contributed. Companies like NanoRacks has invested $40 million. I think they're one of the larger uh, investors on the International Space Station, uh, creating a, they will be uh, developing their own airlock uh, for the International Space Station. I think that's going to be delivered in, in 2020 in that time frame. So I, I think they're, you know, again, when you talk about um, the, the numbers that Mr. Martin is talking about, yes, it is a large uh, contribution. But I think it's, it's, it's what the, the, the vision of NASA is. Was NASA designed to be, you know, an economic driver or was it designed to be a, an agency for exploration? And, uh, and I think we got to look at what our priorities are and what NASA's priorities are and working with the, the commercial sector on this. And I think... Uh, the partnership with, that NASA has had over the past two decades, uh, working with the, the commercial industry, 
um, the, 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 the sharing, the information sharing and, um, and the service sharing that we've had, I, I think it's, uh, it's only going to grow. So I'm very optimistic about that. How do you think the relationship could be improved? Uh, there, I, I think just the, the communication on, on the, the pricing, uh, the stability on pricing as they, they've recently re, uh, released, I think, I think greater access, I think once we're able to launch American astronauts from American soil on American vehicles, um, I think that that type of partnership that's going to open up uh, of having routine access to space, I, I think we're going to see a lot more opportunities. I, I was inspired by Scott Kelly's book, Endurance on what it took uh, for a year on, on, the, uh, on the space station and the challenges that they had and routine challenges, um, just regular uh, preventive maintenance they need to do. Um, and I think having this, this commercial access and not being dependent um, on, a, on a foreign nation to provide our astronauts uh, access to space at you know, rather large uh, rates and the cost savings that we'll have, I think it's going to greatly enhance the, the capabilities that the commercial uh, sector and, and NASA can uh, to greater partner with. But I think we have a very good partnership, and, uh, and I think Mr. Gerson Meyer's leadership has been, has been outstanding on that front. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Mr. Well, no, he's not there. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Olson. I thank the chair and welcome to our four expert witnesses. One thing we all agree upon, the activities of the ISS must keep going and expand in the future. We can't go back one step back. We can't do that. The question is, will that future be the ISS, some expansion, some new experiment platform, maybe something on near the moon or something based on the moon. We avoid human debris fields for sure, but that's very expensive. And so regardless, the International Space Station has been a great asset. I want to remind everybody what this space station has done. Every single day since November 2nd of 2000, we've got a human being in orbit on the International Space Station, 230 miles above our planet, and in fact, our two honored guests over there, these two amazing ladies, weren't born when the station went into orbit and became active. But we're here to make sure you have a space station or something like that to go to when you walk on the moon or walk on Mars and wave to us and say, hey, Energy Co uh, Committee there, Space Science Technology Committee, I'm on Mars. I'm on the moon. We all know, too, the ISS has done great wonders, great experience, experience we can't do here on Earth. Couple examples, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, AMS. It's been up there since 2013, and it may have discovered the start of dark matter. As you all know, most of our universe is dark matter, and that's a huge benefit for human life. Also, as you guys talked about, the benefits to human health that we've learned at the International Space Station. For example, learning how to deal with muscle atrophy, also bone density loss, and fluid shifts. And just what we've learned, we learned that Scott Kelly can now call his twin, or could call his twin, Mark Shrimp, for a few weeks because Scott was two weeks taller than Mark when he came back home after almost one year in space. I want to talk about going forward and making sure we keep this an international space station. That means, I mean, we have a plan to stop flying or something by 2024 right now that could be extended. I want to ask a question of all of you, starting with you, Gertz. How are international partners engaged in this they want us to extend it. How long? What will they pay? I mean, again, this is we got Japan, China, Russia, America, including the Republic of Texas, European Space Agency, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, the United Kingdom. All these nations are involved right now at space station. How are they going forward with our plans? Do they want to go to 2024 or longer? And what will they put up to help us go make those things happen? 
I think in general, the international partnership wants to continue using station. They see it still as a resource that has plenty of life in the future, and they want to continue to use it. There's a European ministerial at the end of this year, in uh, November of this year, and at that time we should see a formal position from European Space Agency about their position of using station beyond 2024. Mr. Martin. Again, just to caution, every space agency, like every government, has a limited budget. So ESA's budget, while significant and important to maintenance of the International Space Station, is much, much smaller than NASA's. I've, I've, from what I've read, they've shown some interest in being part of a Chinese, a planned Chinese space station set to launch and begin construction in 2022. I just don't know that their budget is large enough to continue their current commitment to the ISS past 2024, as well as partake in perhaps the Artemis mission with the U.S. or the Chinese space station activities. Mr. Stalber. The United States is the global leader in space, and I think we need to continue to be that way. I think the international partnerships uh, that we have on the, uh, the space station are critical uh, and, and most necessary, and I think we should continue to engage our, our global partners. But do keep in mind, um, when you walk around the United States, the Republic of Texas, uh, all over the world, uh, you see people wearing NASA t-shirts. It's a brand. You don't see people wearing other space agency, the Polish space agency, or anything else, uh, t-shirts. Yeah. So I, I think that's critical to keep in mind. The leadership that NASA provides the world um, is imperative. And not to butch name, but Dr. G, any comments on? That's what my students call me. Please feel free. <laughs> um, and as a good Brinowitz, I do not like you dissing the Polish space agents. I, I only do that because they're one of the newest space agencies around, and okay. I don't know what their logo is. But I'm fully supportive of the Polish space agency and all global space agencies, except for two. OK. Um, coming from a space law perspective, the reason why we have the Outer Space Treaty and other treaties is because the world faced its worst fears at the time placing nuclear weapons in space. And people forget that the Outer Space Treaty prohibits putting nuclear weapons in space, which makes it one of the most important treaties of the 20th century. But the treaty also provides for our highest aspirations, which are uh, space is dedicated to peaceful purposes for all humankind. When the space station was first proposed by President Reagan, it was the height of the Cold War. The Soviet Union were, was our enemy. And then a funny thing happened on the way to the space station. The Cold War came to an end, and the Soviet Union became the Russians, and the Russians became a partner. And now here we are in the era of globalization, and we've had a space station for 30 years in which we have learned how to work together with one another. And each, each each country that is in that station is making a commitment financially, technologically, and otherwise that relative to their assets is just as great as what the United States provides. And I would point out the Canada arm as a fantastic example of that. The Canada arm in terms of dollars is a relatively smaller uh, contribution than some of the other bigger elements. But we would not have a space station without the Canada arm. So I think we need to think of the space station in terms of quality as well as quantity and the quality of the relationships we have with 15 other nations through the space station agreement is not to be understated. That way over my time, Chairman, I thank you so much. I want to remind you there's a special countdown happening right now around Johnson Space in Houston, Texas. It's T minus 94 days and counting until the Texas Longhorns repeat and beat the Oklahoma Sooners. They boom them <laughs> in Dallas, Texas. I yield back. I, I think you're being overly optimistic. <laughs> And, and let's just be clear, it's OU Texas, not Texas OU, uh, for all of the Texans in the room. Uh, you know, see what you started, Mr. Salmer, you know, Polish Space Agency, of course, Mr. Olson. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes Mr. Waltz. Hopefully the Floridian won't cause quite as many problems as our Texan over here. Well, I do have to say, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, we've heard a lot about Alabama's the... Um, 
as the home of space and, and tech, the Republic of Texas, but I think we all know where space DNA really resides, which is in Florida, and, and excited to celebrate the 50th anniversary of, uh, of Apollo 11 coming up. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of discussion today uh, around the international aspects of, uh, of the ISS. I am very focused also as a member of uh, the Armed Services Committee on what the Chinese uh, in particular are doing in space. Uh, I think it is always worth remembering and reminding that the, the Chinese military is behind every component, major component of what the Chinese are doing in space, whether that's in their new space station or if they uh, have manned research station on the moon. I put research in, in air quotes uh, on the moon. And that basically everything that NASA has, has done going forward or, or looking backwards uh, has not been in the same type of competitive and, and potentially hostile environment that we will look at going, going forward. So I think we all agree that American and NASA leadership in space must continue. Uh, we must maintain a low Earth orbit. Please interject if you disagree that we must maintain LEO uh, and we must maintain a presence, and particularly if it's a competitive space uh, going forward. But the disconnect seems like the white elephant in the room is whether this plan will actually work with commercialization and whether it will work in the timeline. And I'm hearing, um, I'm hearing from the Inspector General that some skepticism, is that fair? to say that the plan will actually work to be able to take on that O&M budget of operating the space station uh, in the timeline proposed? Skepticism is in an inspector general's job description. Sure, I know it's built in. Uh, it is, it's a real concern. The $1.2 billion operation and maintenance annual cost of maintaining station. Right. Correct. So, so President Reagan put forward a plan what, approximately 10 years in advance uh, what is NASA's? I mean, what is NASA's Plan B? I've heard, I've heard you ask. When are we going to see that Plan B? That if the figures don't work and the private sector can't take it on, when are we? When, are, when What's the decision point to extend beyond 2024? And then what's the what's the decision point to extend beyond 2028 or to have a new vehicle or to have a new platform in place? Mr. Gersmeyer. We have some time to decide for the new platform in place. That's not an immediate problem. I think we need to... What, what is the time, right? Is it six years? Then, If it's not 10, then is it five years, six years? What is, as you're look, in the military, we forecast, right? What's that decision point? It's probably about six years out or so. So that would be probably 20, 30 kind of lifetime, and then back that up six years. Assuming the four-year extension? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and so, but but I think the more important thing is we need some stability and understanding for the commercial sector so they can plan. I think it's also probably not appropriate to assume that the private sector is going to take over all the costs of the capability we have in low Earth orbit. But we can reduce that cost by using the private sector where we're now, we're not the only um, agency taking people to space. The private sector is doing that on their own through private astronaut missions, et cetera. So we're one of many customers. That reduces our costs some amount. How much we reduce that cost is, is important to us. We don't, I don't think we can predict that, but we need to try to drive to that situation. What okay. we need to avoid is we need to avoid the gap that was discussed here, especially in light of the Chinese space station, which could be in orbit, a portion of it, even as early as this year or next year. Um, we need to make sure that we don't create a gap where we, the U.S., don't have a facility in Absolutely. low Earth orbit, and there's only the Chinese. Absolutely, 100% agree. Mr. Stalmer, uh, in the time I have remaining, the FAA, switching tracks here, the FAA recently released a notice of proposed, proposed rulemaking regarding regulatory reform for launch and reentry of commercial vehicles. Obviously, launch is critical to everything we've discussed today. Uh, with projections of getting up to 50 plus flights by 2021. What are your thoughts on how industry views the draft rules that are out? What needs to be addressed moving forward uh, to enable the American companies and private sectors to operate efficiently? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, in short, we, we, we have concerns. We have concerns. Uh, there's a directive put out that we're gonna streamline you know, the regulatory um, burden that a lot of the industry is facing. And I, I say a burden, it, it's, it's a burden because it hasn't been updated 
Um, that what the launch industry was back in, in the mid 80s is different from what the launch industry is today in, in 2019. Uh, there's more commercial uh, launch vehicles than ever. We have uh, just for NASA alone four vehicles, you know, that will be servicing um, the, the space station uh, with reusability. So these issues need to be addressed. And I think um, with this rulemaking process, I think the FAA really needs to hear, um, especially the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, really needs to hear what industry has to say on how their industry is being regulated. Um, it has to. It can't be so. It has to be performance based rather than is so prescriptive based. Um, and I think the FAA needs to work more with with industry and in understanding what their needs are. And, and and we're trying to get there. We're trying to get there. We do have a, t a deadline um, of July 30th, um, which is is closing in on us. Madam Chair, if you'll indulge me, could you submit a more fulsome response for the record? I certainly can. Thank you. I certainly can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waltz. Mr. Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as a card-carrying member of the Republican of, of Republic of Texas, regarding the Texas and the Johnson Space Center's preeminence, let me just say that my colleagues can feel free to express their confusion and lack of understanding anytime they want to. And Madam Chair, without objection, I'd like that read into the record. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, when we when we partner with industry. How do we ensure that we don't take jobs away from our NASA facilities? Let me qualify that. My district, half a mile south of uh, NASA, the Johnson Space Center, has thousands of people that work in my district. It's huge for us as a country, national security, and I'll talk about that more. But how do we ensure that we don't take jobs away from NASA? And I like the thing about the NASA T-shirt, by the way. You only see, all you see is NASA T-shirts. You don't see, who was that other smaller space agency? Don't recall. Oh, you don't recall? Oh. Okay. All right. For, exa for example, Boeing is subcontracting back to JSC to handle mission control for the Starliner missions. My district is home to many of those great NASA employees who work there, and some 50% of the JSC jobs are tied to ISS. So I think it's critical that we ensure that the commercialization of ISS will still model that of the space shuttle and ISS programs where integration, operations, and other activities are still done. Did I mention Johnson Space Center is close to me? So Mr. G uh, Gerstenmeyer, how do we ensure that that happens, that we don't want those jobs to go away? You know, again, it, I think the right role for NASA is to do the, the long-term research, technology, and exploration. So the activities around the moon, those kind of things that we don't really know how to do to build the next generation of rocket engines, to build the next generation of flight control strategies, those kind of things of how we operate independently from the Earth, those are the roles of the government to do that, to establish that first where it doesn't make sense. We're building the heavy lift launch vehicle, as you know, the space launch system. There's not really a market for that. If you look at that, that's really unique to what we need to do around the moon and other activities. But then once that market then comes behind it, then we can use the private sector. So I think the role of the civil servants are to do these really hard research, cutting edge technology development that don't make sense at all for industry. It's good for the government to own that because then we can distribute that to industry as a whole and they can use that moving forward. So I think there's a strong role for the civil servants in the government to continue to do those research activities. Well, thank you, thank you for that. Mr. Stalmer, uh, Mr. Martin, you said that, uh, and I'm gonna have to, you said the Chinese space station is set to be operable 2022, was that the year you said? I believe it's going to be, uh, portions will be in orbit by 2020, Bill. Is it 2020? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stalmer, I wanna fix one thing that you said. In your comments, you said that you think the USA needs to be the leader in space. The USA does we, yes, need sir. to be the leader in space. We are, and we need to continue yeah. to be uh, yeah. our leadership. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to point out. Uh, now, Dr. G discussing uh, his dissing of the Polish space agency. It, it was just noting another space agency okay. that, <coughs> that does not have T-shirts. It's, it's, it's no big deal, Mr. Stalmer. It's just something people are going to remember about you for a long time. <laughs> I, I get hate mail. I get hate mail. I yeah. Well, welcome to the club. Okay. Can we strike that from the record, Chairman? <laughs> um, and I appreciate you talking about the international agreement, no nukes in space. But I do want to point out, military experts know that in any military conflict, the high, whoever occupies the high ground has the upper hand. There is no higher ground than space. And so 
Uh, while I appreciate that uh, in the words of nuclear nonproliferation or in terms of nuclear nonproliferation, I still want the United States of America to have preeminence in space. I absolutely do. And I remember a great one-liner from Senator uh, Graham who said that if the lamb is going to lie down with uh, the lion, we want America to be the lion. So space is important to us. Uh, we want to have that preeminence and make sure that we maintain that. A couple of small uh, questions I have in my time left over. Uh, Mr. Gertzenmeyer, Gertz you said that uh, we had improved the, increased the bandwidth some 600 percent, did you say? It, the bandwidth is 600 megabits. 600 megabits. What was it? It was, I think, uh, about uh, 100 megabits. Per so second. that's a substantial increase. So we're making, we're making progress. Okay. Well, I, will, I appreciate all you all being here to testify, and I will close by saying, Madam Chairwoman, let me wish you a happy belated birthday yesterday. Thank you. It was actually June, but thank you. Okay. <laughs> Madam Chairman, would you strike the comments from the I, record? I, I will be happy to. Okay. You, you got the date right, okay. but so very close, and okay. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I, I think we can all point to Mr. Stalmers having started the trouble with his, with his comments uh, about the, the, the Polish uh, space agency. Um, but, but I want to, I've got a couple more questions. I want to sincerely thank uh, all of the members on this committee and all of the panelists. As you can tell, uh, this is uh, an issue that is critical. I know it's not news to any of you, but it's also an issue that is critical to all of us that we are attempting to ask and and frame these important questions about how we move forward, uh, about how we avoid capability gaps in the future and an absence of a, of a, a space station, the absence of the ability to do research and, and exploration in low Earth orbit, the, the issues surrounding certainty and the, the investment of our taxpayer dollars and how we get there, where is the role of a, an emerging commercial sector and how much we subsidize uh, these priorities that are critical to all of us, as well as uh, Dr. Gabrinowitz, the the legal structure and the legal questions that will inevitably face us. Because, uh, Mr. Weber, I agree with you absolutely. We have got we we absolutely have to invest and be intentional about maintaining our investment and our preeminence in space. It is important for our scientific advancement. It is important for our national security and for our our commercial sector and and our ability to move forward. Uh, and so having said that, uh, I, I want, I've got just a couple more very quick questions before we, we close out this hearing that I, I think are, that have been raised for me. Uh, throughout, the, throughout the questions, I, I, I've seen a, a few themes from all of you and from all of us, the, the capability gap and the transition, how we navigate that and what the extension is. Uh, the need for certainty both from NASA and from the commercial sector for us to plan because space and complicated issues require ongoing planning. How we prioritize and where we have to make those hard choices uh, about the pathway forward and, and finally, the, the risk and, and the legal structure and the, the need to, to a ask all those questions and for us to give authorization and, and put that into law on the legal side, but also a, a framework. So, uh, uh, Mr. Martin, I, there's, there's a question that I, would, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, the, 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 the cost and the subsidies for commercial. And so my question is, what is the percentage uh, of subsidy as a part of the commercial LEO development plan. We've talked about different aspects of it, but can you speak to the percentage of NASA subsidy? You're talking about the newly released? Yes. 85%. 85%, okay. And uh, Dr. Gabrinowitz, uh, one additional question. When we're speaking about the U.S. government responsibilities and legal obligations under the Outer Space Treaty uh, and looking forward with commercial astronauts and other commercial entities, what level of ownership does the U.S. government need to have in order to ensure sufficient oversight of a commercial space station? That's not an answerable question at this point because the law doesn't speak in degrees. It speaks in principles at this point. Could you speak to some of those principles that w need to be taken into consideration or used to create that legal framework then? Well, um, 
regarding the Outer Space Treaty is the principle I raised about international responsibility. That is, that is a principle that the United States government <coughs> is responsible for its non-governmental space actors. The degree and kind of responsibility is going to be defined by what actually happens. And we don't, these would be cases of first impression, so we don't know what it's gonna be. Uh, then the other principle is in the International Space Station Agreement, which says even with the transfer of elements, the obligations of the partner still remains. So again, that hasn't been done yet, so uh, we're gonna figure that out as we do it. But the principle is already there. Responsibility will continue to be, uh, I'm sorry, rights and obligations will continue to be in force even after the transfer of elements. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gerstenmeyer, would you care to comment? Again, I think her points are valid. I think it's the rights and ownership responsibility of governments are important because it, it cuts the other way too. If one of the other national partners want to remove, they can't remove themselves from their rights and responsibilities. So I think it's a good benefit both ways. Another thing we should talk a little bit about at some point is also the, potentially maybe the role of the Commerce Department in some of these activities as we talk about economic development. We're not really an economic development agency. We're, we're doing cutting edge research and exploration. We're doing our best to move forward, but there may be a role for commerce in this activity that, that should be thought about as well as potential funding sources. Maybe it's not the burden of NASA to fund all this stuff. Maybe some of these transportation costs and other things may come from other areas of the government, but those should be discussed as well. Thank, thank you for raising that point. Yes, there are very clearly uh, issues surrounding commercial development and the, and the Department of Commerce that, that this committee and others will need to tackle moving forward. So, uh, Mr. Babin, do you have further questions? I have no other questions except to say <clears throat> it's been a great uh, hearing. I've enjoyed uh, listening to, to the expert answers. Thanks, thank you for having this. I also want to say thank you to you Johnson Space Center folks that uh, came up here to, uh, uh, to visit and get a little uh, continuing education and uh, proud of you for being here and all the great work you do uh, back home. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Babbitt, and yes, thank you to all of our civil servants and, and the work that, that you've done, and thank you to our panelists. I, I agree, this is an important topic, and, and your insights were incredibly valuable as we tackle this, this critical issue about how we make the transition. And uh, I want to thank the, the committee as well as all of the witnesses for, for your participation. And note that the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. And the witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>